Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're just delighted to be here. Uh, I want to thank Kim for that ter terrific introduction and to echo her uh, uh, thanks to the incredible Politico team that has pulled this event together. Uh, I can't uh, tell you how extraordinary it has been to uh, watch this group in action. And I think we're in store for something really different uh, this morning. So I'm excited to kick off the summit. I think everyone at Politico, we sat back in the morning after the election and we said, uh, well, gee, don't we have a summit coming up of women? Wouldn't it be something to talk about 100 women uh, on Capitol Hill for the first time? Uh, and it seemed like such an incredible and natural focal point for our conversation. Uh, and I think uh, I'm delighted to be able to kick off the conversation this morning because I think we're at such an inflection point, right? On the one hand, uh, we have this, this milestone and, and every woman here, uh, both on this panel and most of you in the audience too, have still experienced this phenomenon of being the first at something, uh, you know, the breakthrough of this or the breakthrough of that. And now we have the first time that there are triple digit women on the Hill. Uh, but on purpose, uh, I, I asked a question in the framing of this opening panel, which is, okay, great, 100 women on the Hill, but um, you know, are we sure we should cheer? What exactly is it that we're cheering? Last night when I was thinking about this conversation, uh, I was going back over the numbers, and these are numbers that everyone on this panel is very familiar with. Uh, before we cheer too loudly, uh, the number of women in the entire history of the United States Senate is 44. 44, that's right. So even if we had every woman who had ever served uh, show up uh, over on Capitol Hill today, there still wouldn't be an equal number of women and men. And I think, you know, again, I say that in the context of framing. One of the things we did for this summit today was we have collected, uh, not just on this panel this morning, but overall, we have something like two dozen of the members, women members of Congress ha are joining us today for the Women Rule Summit. So it's a pretty unusual and extraordinary gathering of uh, female political talent, if you will. And we, we surveyed all of them and we asked them some questions. And one of the questions we asked was, when will women achieve gender parity uh, on Capitol Hill? And I have to tell you that uh, this is a very unscientific survey, but uh, hands down, not in my lifetime uh, was the winner of that. <laughs> Do we have any dissenters uh, from this group on that? Well, I, you know, I would just like to say that, um, you know, we, we do think differently than our male colleagues, and so I'm not sure that we'll ever reach that, that equality goal as far as numbers, um, but we certainly do outsmart them. I will tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I did a speech about women in politics. Oh, this has probably been eight years ago now, and as part of that, we really looked at the numbers about women in politics, and the predictions at that point were in order for women to reach parity in Congress, it would take another 100 years. So certainly not in our lifetime unless things change dramatically. And even though, as you say, we may be smarter and we may be playing above our numbers, um, it's still, we need to reach parity. That's the bottom line. I would say that we're not going to reach parity until women step forward and start running and women start supporting other women. So this, raises, this raises a very important point, actually, uh, which I, I'm really interested to hear. We have a very bipartisan group this morning, which is the question of uh, bipartisanship. A number of uh, women members in our little informal survey made the case for women politicians as, as actually bringing a different dimension to Congress and engaging uh, in a more bipartisan, a more collaborative style. Uh, this is a big debate, uh, not only in politics, but also certainly in business uh, as well. There are some who believe that uh, there is a different women's style of leadership. There are many others who think that's bunk and that uh, <laughs> it's simply a reflection of women having been such an outnumbered minority. Uh, now this year, I believe uh, you did have some other women members campaigning against you, Senator Shaheen, uh, when you were up for re-election. Well, I didn't have an opponent who was mm -hmm. a woman. Mm -hmm. But to speak to the collaboration issue, I think we have a really good example in 
when we look at the effort to get the government up and running again on the Senate side, Susan Collins was the person who led that effort, and she brought together a, a real coalition, bipartisan coalition of people to do that, and it was heavily women, right, Susan? Yes. Um, almost half of the 14 of us who worked on that were women, and I think that speaks to Susan's, mm -hmm. as a woman, her leadership style and c collaborative ability. And that's really one of the things that's going to be important. You know, your first question asked, when will we achieve numerical parity? Um, I, this is going to sound heretical, but I'm not sure that even matters. I mean, we, it, what, it does matter that we have closer to parity, quite a bit more. Um, and it's going to take us a long time to get there. But I think what is more important is, when are the women serving now and that continue to serve in the future going to use what we all acknowledge is our ability to be collegial and work together and to not be as dug in hard as, uh, as our male counterparts and assert enough leadership to be able to really try to turn things around and diminish the polarization and get more things done on the bigger questions. And I, I, I think opportunities like this one give us that chance. And when we play softball together, as all of us, as all of us have, and, and reach across the aisle and, and really make it our business to, uh, to, to lead. So I want to get back to this question of bipartisanship, but I, in, in our little survey, I, I was struck by the fact I asked all of the women, what's the most sexist thing that you've encountered in politics or uh, in your career on Capitol Hill? First of all, I was struck by the fact that every single person said, yes, absolutely, there are many incidents. Uh, several, several women said, basically, there were too many to count. But Congresswoman uh, Wasserman Schultz had a, a very relevant uh, answer to this. She said, being the mother is the best job I could ever have hoped for, but my opponent in my first race for Congress actually spent the campaign saying, you can be a good mother or a good member of Congress, but you can't be both at the same time. Mm. And here's the best part. My opponent that year was a woman. Uh, can you imagine? My, Nove my victory that November felt extra special. So clearly women aren't afraid uh, to campaign against each other. Well, e even, I, I think it's, I think it's okay. I think we all understand when you've been in politics a long time that, uh, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt our feelings when we campaign against one another. We do have different ideas and we are members of our own party and we have an agenda and, and I, I think we, we aren't going to abandon those principles. But what I think so often the women I've dealt with in the 22 years I've been in office in three legislative bodies is that women more often understand that it's, that it's not personal. <laughs> that, that, you know, we can, we can spend time together working on an issue. Uh, I've worked with each of those, th these women on, on issues, but then there are times when we're gonna disagree, and it's okay to disagree. What my opponent in my first race did was she did get personal. Because you can say whatever you want about me. You, you challenge my quality as a parent, and you were going to have a problem. And the problem that she had is I got 70% of the vote in that election because no one agreed with her. <laughs> Congresswoman, oh, sorry, yes, go I, ahead. I, I, I'll just kind of jump onto the same. The first time that I ran for Congress in 2000, uh, I had much the same comment. How can you leave your children? And it was from another woman. And I think maybe there was a little, um, she was thinking to herself, it's something I would never do or... If I'm not doing it, maybe I can sort of be critical of what Shelley's trying to do because I don't have the nerve to do it. And I think sometimes we end up being, uh, we can talk about sexism, and, but sometimes women aren't as supportive of other women as we need to be. We see it in the workplace all the time, and we certainly see it in politics. And one of the things I think that's exciting about this year, over the 14 years that I've been in Congress, is we have some really younger women. We have Kathy McMorris Rogers, who's had three children while she's been serving. Linda Sanchez had a baby while she's serving. I mean, when I came in in 2000, of the 50-some women that we had, only seven of us had children under the age of 18. Yep. So it's a process. We elected in West Virginia the youngest woman ever elected to the state legislature. She's 18 years old. Wow. So we elected the youngest woman member ever to Congress this year. She's 30 years old. So to me, that gives me great hope for the future. And maybe we'll get there. 
But although I was thinking, Gene, there's this new thing that says that if we take the right kind of medicines, we're going to live to 150. <laughs> so maybe so we will be that? around. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, Congressman Ellers, I, I want to ask about this question of bipartisanship versus partisanship. Uh, you know, we have the chairwoman of the Democratic National Committee here. I, this has been there's been a lot of talk about the war on women uh, in this in this last campaign. I, I, I'm, I'm curious, first of all, how it is you think uh, you know women on the one hand make these claims for bipartisanship and this notion that adding women to Congress will in fact sort of diversify and change the model of leadership into more collaborative. And then on the other hand, uh, the status of women itself has become a partisan issue uh, in the last few campaign cycles. Well, there again, I think this is one of those times when uh, leading by example is really the way to go. And, you know, we certainly are striving to um, elect more Republican women uh, to Congress, and that has been a big focus of ours, um, you know, this, this last election. And, you know, trying to reach out, trying to message to women that, you know what, it's not all about politics. We deal with politics in everything we do, and women wear so many different hats. Let's face it, in our families we deal with politics, in our churches we deal with politics, our civic organizations, certainly the workplace. And, you know, being an elected official is no different. And I think what we have to overcome is that, that idea that it's all negative. You know, unfortunately, when you turn on the 24-hour news cycle, typically you're seeing two people disagreeing with each other. I think we need to break away from that. You know, um, Shell, we, we have um, a bill that we're going to be, um, you know, on the floor today. Uh, Debbie and I, um, this, is, this is a bill that, that is very, very meaningful to Debbie. Um, young breast cancer, uh, early, the early act is what we're going to be voting on. And we'll be working together, and it will be bipartisan. And I think the American people are ready to see more of that. I think they want to see more of that. And I think women can lead on this issue. We are much more about practicality than the politics. And I think that's what we need to go with into the future. And you know? to, but to the question you asked earlier, uh, you know, about campaigning against each other or disagreeing, at the same time, I mean, Renee was the person that I went to uh, on the Republican side to, to be the sponsor of the early act, which was, you know, for me, very, very personal as a breast cancer survivor. But at the same time, we also pretty regularly debate one another on TV on issues that are important to the country. And, you know, we, 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 we get into it pretty hard. Uh, well, I want to get Senator hard. Collins in here. But, but just quickly, on the war on women, uh, y you feel comfortable saying, on the one hand, the Republican Party is engaging in a war on women. On the other hand, working in a bipartisan fashion with other Republican members of Congress. Like I said, I, I feel comfortable taking uh, firmly held positions on issues that matter to women from my point of view and my constituents' point of view, and, uh, and, and still being able to reach across the aisle and find common ground. And, and that's, that, that's, that is, I think, what we need more of. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact is, women don't speak with one voice. We're, we're not monolithic. And, mm -hmm. and often, I think, people covering um, yeah. women in politics think we should all think the same way exactly. and have the same <laughs> positions, you know, and, and we don't, and just like men don't. So it's important to recognize that and not to assume that means that um, we're not supportive of each other. Mm -hmm. that, that's exactly the point that I was going to make. Uh, it is a mistake to think, and we should all resist the notion that women think alike. <clears throat> women span the ideological spectrum just as men do. Where I think there is an important difference is I think in the style of governing. Women tend to be more collaborative. Mm -hmm. That's what you see. But it drives me crazy when people assume that we have the same views on issue or that we think alike on the agenda, because we don't. And if you think about it, that's an attempt to pigeonhole women, to have them work only on certain issues. There's no such thing as a woman's issue. There's no such thing, with all due respect, as a war on women. Every issue is a woman's issue, whether it's taxes or decisions to go to war or health care. Every issue affects women. Where it makes a real difference is when we finally got to 20 women 
in the Senate this last cycle, we were able to have a woman on each of the Senate committees. Mm -hmm. And that does matter because we do bring different life experiences and different perspectives to the debate, even if we don't have the same view. And, and the important thing about that in the Senate is not just has there been a woman on each committee, but women have chaired two out of the three money committees. And so it's not just about getting women into Congress, it's about getting women in positions of power in Congress. Mm -hmm. That's important. I do want to push back on the notion that there aren't issues that are uniquely or more important to women than, than, uh, than to men, or, because there's no question that with a critical mass of women serving in public office, there are issues that never reached the top of the legislative agenda that do now because we have more women. And there are certainly issues that because we are mothers and because of the lens that we look through uh, are, are more important to women, uh, education, health care, uh, making children's safety, uh, there, there are uh, you know, women's health. I mean, so there is a reason that we want to make sure we elect more women, and there's a reason that if we, when we work together, we can push those issues to the top of the legislative agenda. Um, and there's a pretty significant contrast that occurs when you have the agenda you know, more exclusively set by men than by women. So I, I think I, it's really dangerous to divide issues and say, these are women's issues, these are men's issues. That marginalizes the contributions that women make to the debate on every issue. So I understand what Debbie's saying, and actually we agree on a lot of those issues, but if we say that only certain issues are important to women, we will cause ourselves to be left out of important debates. I know and, and it's one of the things that voters um, tend to look at women and make decisions about that influence whether women can get elected. For example, voters generally don't think we're as good on is economic issues, on national security issues, on what are considered the hard issues. And that's a problem in a year like we just had, um, where national security was front and center that has an influence in those races. And so it really is important for us to, to urge people to look at women dealing with all of these issues, not just with certain issues. I want to get you know, Senator I, Capito in here. Thank you, yes, because the, the whole slogan of the war on women, I'm not going to play as nice right here, because it's pretty hard to take. When you're a woman office holder that has family issues, that has just as much compassion for the country, and for families and for health care and everything else, uh, just because you have a different approach on how to make solutions to those problems, you are waging a war on women. And we've been bashed with this for more than just a few terms. And what happened this year was I think it rang hollow. Because a lot of women, in my view, are looking at what Susan was saying. Do my children have opportunity? Do they have confidence in the country? Do they feel like the economic policies are going the direction? They're looking at the whole gamut of issues and making that decision not whether it's a war on women or not. And so fighting through that um, labeling and very negativity that's associated with that labeling has not been easy for Republican women. And shame on us for not getting our numbers up to the point where you know, that, that say when, when we go to the ladies' room over on the House side, there's only 17 of us and 63 women, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, it is so lopsided. So this is a challenge, I think, for Republican women. And I don't think it necessarily has to be divisive, but it hasn't been easy, I don't think, in terms of the national rhetoric to fight through this. And I do believe what Susan says. I do think it's a divisive strategy for all of us in this room. Well, I, I think we do, and I, I'm here as a member of Congress, not with my other hat on, but I, I do think there is a reason that we have 63 women that are Democrats in the House and only 17 Republicans, because the perception, uh, and perception, perception becomes reality, and, and voting record is reality, on the issues that are more important to women, that are more likely to re you know, reach the top of the agenda when women focus on them and work together, 
making sure that women have access to health care, making sure that women have uh, you know, access to make reproductive choices, making sure that we have a quality, uh, affordable public education, making sure that we have child care development block grants and that we can get folks uh, to be able to balance work and family more easily. Those are things that have been championed more often by Democrats and that we've struggled to bring Republicans to consensus and not, not, not to agree exactly the way Democrats uh, think it should be, but to even bring those issues to the top of the agenda. And, and that's the problem, and the voters do in polling and in turnout, when you do exit polls, agree more with, with Democrats. So, so I, I'm really struck by the conversation, uh, not just because it, because it really reflects the fact that there's, it, it's a debate over policy on some level uh, versus process, right? That uh, it's much easier to unite a conversation around uh, let's get 100 women on Capitol Hill. It's much easier to unite a conversation around the need uh, for having a single woman, by the way, that still seems like a pretty modest goal, a single woman on uh, Senate committees uh, to represent the point of view of 50% of the population. It's, it's hard. Politics is transformed so that it's, it's hard for anyone really to disagree uh, on the process notion of putting women at the table. Uh, but it's striking where we're at this moment now, perhaps because we've achieved critical mass, where the debate has become one of you know, whether there is a substantive uh, difference or a policy difference that comes. And I think that's what's striking, too, is, is Senator Collins' point about uh, not wanting to be pigeonholed uh, as a women's issue advocate, and that there's a real dividing line between those who believe uh, that there is, in fact, a substantive women's agenda and somebody who wants to focus, uh, as I have in recent years, on, say, foreign policy uh, or national security and not wanting, resisting the, the labeling. And I, I'm struck by that. I'd love to go around and, and talk a little bit more in concrete terms. 100 women on Capitol Hill. You talked about having women on Senate committees. One woman does seem like a pretty pitiful number in all honesty. Do, do, do people have specific things that you're hoping uh, to change about the institution of Congress as you go from being a really, really small minority uh, to a perhaps much more uh, influential uh, uh, minority? <laughs> Senator Collins. Yes, is the answer to that. Uh, there's too much hyperpartisanship that's led to dysfunction in Washington, and I think that the women in both the House and the Senate can help lead the way to a more collaborative uh, Congress in which we focus on issues rather than constantly trying to score partisan political points and actually get something done. And Jean was very kind to, to mention an effort that I led last year to end the government shutdown. She was a member of our group, a valuable member of our group, uh, which I called the Common Sense Coalition. And it was so significant because when I went to the Senate floor and implored my colleagues to come out of their partisan corners, to start legislating in a manner that was worthy of the people of this great country, the first phone calls I got were all from women. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. Then Jean organized a dinner, one of our famous women senators' dinner, and that was the topic at the dinner. So I think women can lead the way to helping to repair the process, and the process does count. People lose confidence in government and our ability to get things done when we're just constantly lobbing rhetorical bombs at the other side rather than truly debating the issues of the day. See, and I, that, that's why I think we, we shouldn't be debating whether there is or is not a war on women, because what matters is that I have confidence as a legislator that even though Renee and I, Shelley, each of these women might not think the same on every issue, if we had an opportunity to sit down in a room and put the most significant issues on the table, we could spend time over a period of days and, and weeks focusing on this, those issues, separating the things we don't agree on, and I am... 100% confident, given the opportunity that even though we disagree on a lot, that we could get to agreement. 
more rapidly than our male counterparts do. I, I agree, I agree, and um, I do want to echo what uh, Susan had said about common sense. I think that we bring that common sense discussion, again, putting practicality over politics. We can get in the room and come to a consensus, and I do think, look, moving forward, the American people want to see this. I think, you know, we have, we have put forward many pieces of very good legislation this past Congress, the Skills Act, the Working Families Flexibility Act, um, working on I education issues, working human trafficking, another huge issue that affects women, women, men, children um, also, but you know, from a focus of family and how we can make everyone's families work better, life better in this country. And you know, there again, I think, I think as we're moving forward, what, what I've seen in, in kind of a little bit of a shift to where women are thinking, I think it's all about security now. Economic security, national security, and personal security. And I think as long as we're focusing on those issues, we have a very important discussion moving forward, and we can work together in a, in a better fashion. So, Thanks. Senator Shaheen, and then I, I do want to get uh, at least a couple questions from the audience, because we have such a packed house here, and I know they'll have uh, better questions than I will for you. I just wanted to take issue with your notion that we're at a critical mass in Congress, yeah. because while there are 20 women in the Senate, um, Unfortunately, we lost two and we gained two in this election. Um, we're still only one-fifth of the Senate. And the fact is, if you look at the leadership in both the House and Senate, sure, there are women as part of leadership, and that's really important. But until we have parity in leadership and the ability to make the decisions about what happens, we have not reached a critical mass. And everybody here and probably everybody in this room has broken the glass ceiling. But for too many women, they are still under that glass ceiling. And that's why it is so important to elect more women, because regardless of our partisan philosophy, um, we all understand the importance of supporting women um, so that every woman in this country can reach um, her potential. And, and that's hopefully what we're all about as we try and deal with the issues affecting this nation, that, that that's underlying what, what we see as important. Thank you so much, Senator Shaheen. I think that's an important point. That's why we frame the conversation around, you know, okay, it's 100, but great. So questions, please. We have time for a couple, and I'd love to hear uh, some voices from the audience. We have a microphone here. Uh, someone in the front table. Hi. Um, Hold on just one sec for the mic. Oh, my. I completely agree with the notion that um, we need to encourage more women to run. I think that's a critical problem in getting candidates. Um, and and I'm, as part of a campaign op organization, it's been so fascinating to talk to so many women across the country who want to run, but for whatever reason, be it their children or their family situation, they, or fundraising is difficult, they don't feel empowered to do so. What are some suggestions for how we can better train and empower women to step up and run. I, well, I, think I have one. We all. Yeah. 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 Let me tell you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was a plan. Choose I think choose me. Yeah. yeah, I think we need to have a farm team. We need to have encourage women at, at city council level, at county commissioner level, school board level, uh, all those levels to, to build that farm team, to build your confidence, to know how to run a campaign, build a network, and all those things. I think women really undersell what kind of networks they really have. I know when I first ran, I called it my bleacher network because my kids were sports and we were on the bleachers all the time. And that's how I won was that bleacher network. But until you get the confidence at the, at the beginning level that, that you can do it, you can't build to become a governor or a senator or a house member. So that's where I think the encouragement needs to come at so the beginning. I, I know my colleagues are going to cover a lot of things related to women. I, I want to talk about what we need to do to make sure more women can run and by focusing on men. Because I can't tell you how many times I have done a recruitment call to a potential woman candidate. And the issues that we talk through are that include that they are ready to run. They, in their minds, have embraced it, but their partner, spouse, family, uh, they're, they're, the infrastructure that, that they have in place is, is not there, and they can't see how they're going to get there, so ultimately they don't pull the trigger. And we've got to make sure, I, I'd like to see more campaign trainings for the men in our lives where we know women have, the, have a future, because we need to make sure that 
uh, quite frankly, I'll, uh, I'll put in a plug for St. Steve, that, uh, that, that we have more men in this country like Steve Schultz, <laughs> who has always supported me and every step of the way made it possible for me to make the decision to take that next step. Senator Collins. I have done countless recruitment calls of women to try to encourage them to run. And here's what I hear over and over again. Well, I don't think I'm quite ready. That's what I hear. I have never, ever made a recruitment call to a man and have him tell me that he's not ready. And the best way that I can illustrate this is a story that was told to me by former Labor Secretary Lynn Martin. She was former Congresswoman as well. And she said that a woman feels that she has to have a PhD in economics in order to talk about international trade. A man feels that he just has to drive a Honda. And, <laughs> and I truly think there's a lot to that. I think women think, oh, I need one more credential, mm -hmm. or I need a little more experience, or I need to run locally first. And I'm here to tell you, it's not true. If you want to run, go for it. You can do it. And you need to have more confidence in yourself. So, yeah, just, just for example, how many people in this room are thinking that you might run for office someday? Raise your hand. OK, look around. You know, that's great, but look at the number of people in this room and how intelligent and aware all of you are and how few hands went up. And that's exactly what Susan's talking about and what we're all talking about. You know, I, I, I headed for a while the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School, and it always amazed me that I'd have a group of undergraduates from Harvard, you know, you think the top university in the country, and I would say to them, how many of you want to run for office someday? And every male hand in the room almost <laughs> would go up. And maybe a quarter or a third of the women, if it was a good day. So we got we to gotta think about how we can get more women to run. You know, we have over 5,000 elective offices in this country, and most of those go um, uncontested because nobody runs for them. So just what Shelley was saying, you can find that local office in your community where it's a, it's a place to get started, to really feel like you know how this is done and you can build on that. And that's what we've got to do because until more women run for office, more women are not going to get elected. So I think this is unfortunately uh, the moment we have to end. I, obviously, we can go all day. Maybe I can persuade this group to come back and give us a status report after uh, six months on whether uh, 100 women means anything or nothing at all <laughs> uh, when it comes to Capitol Hill. But um, thank you so much. Save up those questions, because we have uh, lots more conversations coming. I, it, it's really it's a terrific uh, and really unusual chance uh, for me to engage in this conversation and for all of us. So I think all of you, and uh, I would say, you know, good luck. <laughs> good luck out there.